now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. We've always talked about the experimental nature of the CBS radio workshop. This is the closest that the the workshop ever comes to write out horror. Elliot Lewis in this episode entitled Nightmare. Originally broadcast May 5th, 1957 on the CBS radio workshop. CBS radio presents the CBS radio workshop dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. This is Elliot Lewis. I believe there's a place for experimental drama in radio. CBS Radio also believes this, hence the radio workshop. The play you're going to hear is such an experiment. It's debatable whether it's too personal an experience. I don't think it is, and CBS Radio has been kind enough to give me the time to find out. Some of you may be offended, some revolted, some excited by the sharing of this experience. At all events, since it is an experiment, and since we'll be dealing with those strange depths in a man's mind called his subconscious, we ask your attention. The play is called Nightmare. Are you all right, Johnny? Johnny? I'm tired. I'm so tired. Well, what was it? Are you all right? Fine. I just felt a little sick. I'm tired. I'll call Dr. Rogers. Oh, it's late. Let the poor man sleep. Call him in the morning if I don't feel better. You sure? Sure. I just want to sleep. I'll call him. Please. It's all right. Well, come to bed then. You can't sit here all night. I'll... I'll be in in a few minutes. Just sit here for a while. I'll stay here with you then. No need. I just get a little rest. I'll stay here. So tired. Fine. I'll stay with you. I won't go away. I won't leave you. I'll stay right here. Number 18 it was on a wide end run. The opposing tackle in black trunks finally downed him on the 19-yard line. And this is a good time to remind you that this is Johnny Scott bringing you the annual Gridiron Classic. That this is Johnny Scott. That's very odd, ladies and gentlemen. There's a man sitting on the far side of the field whose face... He seems to be smiling at something. Perhaps you all know him. He's a tall man wears a black mustache, has black hair parted in the center and well and carefully combed. He's smoking a cigarette. Perhaps you all know him. There's the play. It's number 18 again, this time diving through his own left tackle. This boy is really tremendous. There, there, just now, the opposing tackle grabbed number 18 from behind. The man with the black mustache is applauding. Oh, no. The players on both sides have jumped on number 18 and they're hitting him with their fists. The crowd is going wild. This is horrible. People are jumping from their seats into the field to join in, but they're all on one side, all striking number 18, who's lying face down on the beautiful green sod of this lovely stadium. It's a lovely autumn day here in New Falls, and over 80,000 screaming fans are pounding and kicking player number 18. The man with the black mustache, I'm sure you all must know him. The man with the black mustache is standing in the center of the screaming mob. He seems to be directing their efforts. I've never seen anything like this, ladies and gentlemen. There doesn't seem to be anything anyone can do to save number 18. There, just now, the man with the black mustache picked up the quiet form of my father. He slung my father over his shoulder. He's making his way through the crowd. Why is he carrying my father away? 
Where is he taking my father? Mr. Scott? Pardon? Oh, yes, Captain. We shall be pleased to have you at our table tonight. Oh, thank you, sir, at your table. Of course. Had you forgotten? No, sir, of course not. Very well, at 15 bells. Yes, thank you, Captain. Good. Good work, my boy. Oh, I mustn't forget. Dinner at 15 bells. Master Scott? Hmm? Oh, hello, Miss Simpson. I'm glad to see you again. Really? Oh, of course I am. I always liked you, Miss Simpson. Just because I can't do my algebra doesn't mean I don't like you. Take your seat, please. Can you remember where your place is in this room? <laughs> Class. It seems strange to me that a young man would forget the location of his desk. It seems strange to me that you should be holding your classes on board an ocean-going vessel. An ocean-going vessel? Really? Rogers? Yes, Miss Simpson. You? Good afternoon, John. Weren't you just at the football game? Football game? I've been here in class since first bell. I shall stay here until 15 bells. Miss Simpson? What is it, Master Scott? I'd like to know why this student sitting here next to me has a black mustache and denies being at that football game this afternoon. I object, Miss Simpson. I couldn't have been at that football game this afternoon when it is now only morning. This afternoon, in fact, has not yet arrived. Therefore, I move this entire case be dismissed. Master Scott? Why, well, I have nothing to say. His argument sounds logical, but I saw him hit number 18 at the football game this afternoon. I know I saw him. He hit my father and then carried him away. Miss Simpson, it is obvious to me that since this is morning, this morning to be specific, it is impossible that this young man, John could have seen me this afternoon at anything this afternoon, since this particular afternoon won't be here until after this morning is over. Right? Right. Master Scott? He's trying to trick me. He's just saying words. He always does that. And I won't stand for it. You're going to hit me? I am going to hit you. I'm going to bloody your nose for you. Then hit, then strike, then flay, then pound, then attack, then beat. Go. Let go of my arms and I will. I'm not near your arms. I won't touch your arms. Let go of me. I'm not near your arms. I won't touch your arms. Then let go of me. Don't hit me. Please. <coughs> what? Why did you hit me? <coughs> Stop hitting me. I'm not near your arms. You've got to let go of me. I'm not hitting you, John. There. Now you can't hit me. I've got to r run faster. I think this is when I'm to have dinner with the captain. Mr. Scott, welcome to our little captain's dinner, which we have on board ocean-going vessels every night for invited guests of the captain. I am the captain. May I remark, sir, about your very fine orchestra? You may. They're very fine. Thank you. Now, uh, if everyone will please be seated. Uh, Miss Simpson, over there. An apple for me. Rogers, on her left. Right. Mr. Scott Sr., over there. Thank you. Hello, Dad. Hi, Johnny. Don't bolt your food now. I won't, Dad. And our guest of honor, John Scott Jr., at the head of the table opposite me. Thank you, sir. Ready? On your mark. Get set. Go. Oh, I'm sorry I'm late. I hope I didn't worry anyone. Uh, Miss Vincent, you uh, may sit next to Mr. Scott Secundus at the opposite head of the table. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Pleasure. <laughs> Are you enjoying the cruise, Mr. Scott? Yes, very much, thank you. And you? Very much, thank you. Are you hungry? No, I'm not. Neither am I. Besides, I hate oatmeal. Would you like to go outside? Thank you, I would. They won't notice. You don't think this is forward of me? Of course not. I've never left a dinner table with a young man before. I'm sure you haven't. And I don't at all think it's forward of you. I think it's very admirable of you. Thank you. There's a man in there. The man with the black mustache. He's not a good man or a kind man. 
This afternoon, he almost killed a football player during the big game. And then he grabbed me and hit me in the chest. Doesn't he like you? I don't remember him. I seem to know him. Do you know him? No, I don't. I don't think I do. What's his name? The captain called him Rogers. The name is familiar. I seem to remember him. Kiss me. Thank you, dear. I love you so much, Johnny. And I love you, Ruth. I love you, Ruth. That's good. How long have we been married, Johnny? Four years, seven months, and uh, 12 days. Correct. But I've only known you 10 minutes. Correct. Did you hear that? Oh, yes. It sounded as though we'd scraped bottom. Yeah, there it is again. We're going up a river. Isn't there enough water in the river? Well, they had to let it out. There was a need for it elsewhere. Oh, I see. Do you mind very much? No, I don't mind. That's good. You'll get used to it. Isn't it hard on the bottom of the boat? Perhaps. I'm sorry about your father. Yes. So young to die? My poor dear mother. To lose her love. What will you do now, Johnny? We can't get married, Ruth. Not yet. All right. (laughs) Poor lady. Well, that's not my mother. That's my algebra teacher, Miss Simpson. Poor, poor lady. Good afternoon, Miss Simpson. The class is dismissed. You may all go home. Thank you for being so kind. Please, excuse me. (laughs) Elliot Lewis, Nightmare, the CBS Radio Workshop, May 5th, 1957. This is Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of the CBS Radio Workshop production, Elliot Lewis in Nightmare, May 5th, 1957. Where were you? Where do you want? Where did you go? Why did you go outside? Did you ask me whether it was all right for you to go outside? Don't touch me. I won't touch you. I just want to give you something. (laughs) Don't. Please don't. Don't hit me again. Please don't hit me again. (laughs) Ruth! Ruth! Please come here! Please come here, Ruth! Where did you go? Ruth! Please, Ruth! Don't hit me again. Please don't hit me again. you say, Johnny? Oh, hi, Dad. Hello, son. I thought someone had hit me. The man with the black mustache. What man is that? He was having dinner with us at the captain's table. Oh, yes. The sky looks nice through the trees. That it does. What are we going to do this afternoon, Dad? Would you like to see a baseball game? I'd love to. Then we'll go see a baseball game and eat hot dogs and peanuts and Cracker Jack. I don't care if we never come back, because we'll root... And it's all right if we spoil our dinner? I'll tell Mother to have dinner late tonight. Dad. Yes, Johnny? Could I have the car tonight? I'll be careful. Got a date with Ruth? Yeah. I like her, Johnny. So does your mother. She's a wonderful girl. Do you really like her? You bet I do. That's good. I want to marry her, Dad. That's good, son. That's good, son. I want Ruth and I to be married and have a fine life and kids and a big house and a garden. Dad. What is it, sir? You're dead. Me? Not a chance. But you are. I remember the day you died. You were so sick and you died very quietly. I remember the funeral and how proud we all were because so many people, fine people, came to pay their respects. I didn't die, Johnny. I remember. That must have been a dream, son. This is real, right now. Is it, Dad? Of course it is, son. That was a dream. This is real. 
I can't hear you, Dad. What'd you say? The Yankees are playing today, you know. I can't hear you, Dad. Is something wrong with me? Go tell Mother to have a late supper. Dad! How do you do, young man? Nothing to worry about. What do you want? Nothing to worry about, young man. I have an appointment with your father. You leave my dad alone. Now, don't be nervous. Nothing to worry about. Leave my dad alone, I said. Here now. Step back. Back. <laughs> John. John. What? John. I'm all right, Ruth. I'll be all right. It's just I'm lonely. Johnny. Don't go away, Ruth. Please don't go away. I don't want to be alone here. <laughs> Master Scott? What? Oh, Miss Simpson. Aren't you going to ask me for the next dance? You'd better hurry. My program's almost filled. See? I only have 18 empty spaces. Miss Simpson, may I have the honor of the next 18 dances? Why, Master Scott, what have you said? I should be delighted. My arm? Thank you. You waltz beautifully, Mother. They really knew how to waltz when I was a girl. When I was a girl. You're hardly more than a girl now. That's sweet. And very true. When I was a girl, I never had many empty spaces in my dance program. Young John Scott filled out my program for me at all the dances. We had a dance every Saturday night, and young John Scott was my escort. He was a very dashing young man. Was he? We were married, you know. I was Mrs. John Scott instead of Miss Simpson. I know, Mother. He died, you know. I'm sorry. He just died. No one knew why or how. Your father just died. <laughs> May I borrow your handkerchief, Master Scott? I seem to have left mine in my purse. Certainly, Miss Simpson. Thank you. You may take me back to my chair now, Master Scott. And thank you for a lovely dance. It was a pleasure. I hope I may have the pleasure again. Thank you. The pleasure was all mine. Good evening. Good evening, Rogers. What are you doing here? I was practicing my samba. I have always held that dancing the samba to a waltz is more interesting than dancing a samba to a samba. Don't you agree? Quite. Please excuse me. I'll join you. Thank you for a lovely evening. This way, where are we going? We've moved the office. There are some papers on your desk I think you should look over. What kind of papers? Well, various triplicates, duplicate copies, a few scattered originals, and 18 photo stands. Well, I'd better clear my desk then. I don't like to have a cluttered desk. Too drafty for you? No, not at all. The air feels good. It was stuffy at the dance. Respiration is bad. Bad respiration. That's very strange. What is? I think you said that before to me. Or were you going to say it? Respiration? Have you ever said that to me? It's entirely possible. It's a form of greeting I use. Most people say, how are you, when they meet you on the street. I never say, how are you, when I meet people on the street. I always remark concerning their respiratory tract. Of course, I see. Does the noise of all the typewriters annoy you? No, I can't hear them. That's good. Will you sit down? Thank you. If you'll sit on that typewriter, I'll let you ride back and forth while I make out this report. Well, that's very kind of you. This is very enervating. Just keep your arms out of the way. If you get your arms too near to me, I shall drive this spike through them. It's a hobby of mine. I'll be careful. I promised Ruth I'd be careful. You're a very fortunate man being married to Ruth. I think I am. Don't you know you are? Of course I know I am. Then why did you say you thought you were? It was just a figure of speech. If you don't stop using figures of speech, I shall have to insist that you stop riding on my typewriter carriage. Well, I'd just soon get off anyway. I feel quite dizzy. Now wait till I disconnect the superheterodyne. I'll help you off. 
Your arm. Thank you. Don't. Please, let go of my arm. I'm sorry, didn't mean to hurt you. What's wrong with you? I said I was sorry. What can I say after I've said I'm sorry? <laughs> Is that your song? No. You didn't write that song? No. Hmm. Very well. Then we can get down to the business at hand. May 5th, 1957. Elliot Lewis, Nightmare, the CBS Radio Workshop. May 5th, 1957. You're listening to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station. Classic Radio Theater family, you know our friend Mike Lindell has a passion to help everyone get the best sleep of your life. He didn't stop by just creating the best pillow. He created the best bed sheets ever. They look and feel great, which means an even better night's sleep for me because, you know, I'm working like 67 hours a day. Now, Mike's offering the best deal on his Giza Dreams bed sheets ever. You can get a set of Giza sheets for as low as $29.98. You'll never want to sleep on anything else once you sleep slept on a set of Giza Dream sheets. A special offer for you right now. You can get a set of Giza sheets for as low as $29.98. Call 1-800-928-4715. Use the promo code WYATT or go to MyPillow.com. Use the promo code WYATT. It's good on anything on the website. That number again, 1-800-928-4715. Use my promo code WYATT. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the surprising conclusion to Elliot Lewis in the CBS Radio Workshop production of Nightmare, May 5th, 1957. Will you sign those papers on the desk? Are we allowed to do that? I wouldn't ask otherwise. Your duty is plain. Do it. All right. This is a strange fountain pen. It's the newest model. It's made like a piece of chalk so that it can be erased. Well, that's an excellent idea. Now these photostats. I've never signed a photostat. Just use this camera. Oh, that's a good idea. At the bottom, where the coffin is. Where did you get these? I made them out, kind sir. These are death certificates. Very well written, I think. These are my dad's death certificates. Life carries with the joy so many harsh blows. Who are you? You're so familiar, yet I can't... Just lie back now. Don't struggle. Who are you? That's it. Easy does it. Put that hammer down. What are you doing with that hammer? If you'll just bear your chest... Please don't hit my chest. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to get up. I've got to run away. Up. Get. Up. Oh, why did everyone go away? Why did they all leave me? I wish I knew where I was. I've got to get home. This is such a dark place. I'm afraid of the dark. Ruth. Ruth, I'm afraid of the dark. It's dark and I'm alone, Ruth. Please come and help me. All right. Maybe there's a door down there, down at the other end. Have I... Why is it so hard to walk? You'll be all right. I've got to walk. That'll do it. If I can walk... I can get out of here. Careful, Johnny. It's so far to the door. Maybe someone's moving the, the door away from me. <laughs> Why do they do that? Don't they know I have trouble walking? Don't they know it's hard for me to walk? Struggle. <laughs> Don't. Right. I got to get to the door. I got to get to the door. 
All right. He'll be all right. Oh, thank God. This is a strange thing for a doctor to say, I guess, but I just couldn't let him die. You see, I was the doctor when his father passed away. Oh, I didn't know that. I never knew his father. I haven't seen him since. I've always felt that he bore me a grudge because of his father. Families very often do that, you know. Are you sure he's all right now? Yes, he's all right. A few months of bed rest. He won't be disfigured, crippled? I can promise you he won't be. Strange. What? He struggled against me, fought me so hard. You'd almost think he'd been conscious through the whole seizure. Oh, I don't think he was. He didn't even know me the time his eyes were open. Well, you'd better get some sleep now. I'll stay with him until morning. Then we'll get him to the hospital. He'll be all right. Don't worry about it. All right, Doctor. It is strange, though, the way he fought me. Strange. <laughs> As with all dreams, Elliot Lewis, who played Johnny Scott, also produced, directed, and was the author of tonight's Nightmare. The music was composed and conducted by Fred Steiner. Ruth Scott was played by Mary Jane Croft. Edgar Barrier was Dr. Rogers. Paula Winslow and Herb Butterfield were mother and father Scott. And Barney Phillips was the captain. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced in Hollywood by William N. Robeson. Uh, what a conclusion there. That that soul told you the whole story, didn't it? Explained a lot. Uh, May 5th, 1957, the CBS Radio Workshop on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, an episode of the soap opera Claudia, sponsored by Coca-Cola. May 5th, 1948. Your Coca-Cola bottler presents Claudia based on the play and novels by Rose Franken. Brought to you transcribed Monday through Friday by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax, and while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. And now, Claudia. David, are you sure her train didn't get in already? Who's? The new maid? Of course. Who's do you think? Of course it didn't get in. Her train isn't due until mine leaves. Maybe hers was early. There hasn't been an early train here at Eastbrook Station in years. Besides, there's no one standing on the other platform. But if her train was early and she didn't find me at the station, she'd have thought there was a mistake. She'd have gotten back on and gone away. <laughs> you wish that had to happen, don't you? Who, me? Yeah. Don't try to sound so innocent, greedy. You don't want to share your kitchen with anybody else. I don't want to share my budget with anybody else. Mm, it's big enough. Besides, hiring a maid this way is so complicated. I don't see how it can possibly come out all right. Now, what's complicated about it? Well, firstly, I don't even know what she looks like. Now she's going to come and live in our house. Doesn't that make you feel queer? Not particularly. The agency recommended her, you said. Well, I've never seen the agency either. Well, you told me it was a very good agency. It is. The best in New York. It is. Said. But I've never hired a maid over the telephone before. Oh, that's progress. You have to get used to it. Oh, that's progress? Mm -hmm. That's progress, all right. See, I should have gone to New York myself to find her. That's the whole point of having a mate. What is? <laughs> to save you running around, doing a lot of things you don't have to. Especially now. Especially now. Just because I'm becoming a mother, you want me to act like a bookend? Exactly. Except that I won't make you stay on the mantle. <laughs> you can sit in the chair. Thanks a lot. Oh, nothing to it. Very nice. Yeah. But aren't you, uh... Uh, you aren't to try to keep the whole house going by, the, by yourself. Do you, you know realize that. what we have to give up to have a maid? Oh, sure. Means, uh, no caviar, no champagne. No champagne, and no new car either. That's right. And no new suit. On the farm, I, I won't need new suit. Oh? Overall, thank you. But a maid costs so much money, and David, we have got to economize. 
We figured it out yesterday. Mm -hmm. Remember? We settled it all yesterday, too. With the baby due in two months. Someone to help you is not an extravagance. You probably won't be any good at all. You I wait and think see. she'll be wonderful. I only hope that she likes us. <laughs> She'll probably give us finger bowls with every meal. Finger bowls are fine. Just so she uh, gives us coffee, too. Oh, she'll probably make terrible coffee. I bet you she isn't a very good cook. What do you bet? Then we'll, uh, we'll live on eggs and milk and, and no complaints. She won't cook eggs and milk. Her specialties are probably creamed oyster plants. <laughs> then we'll just learn to like creamed oysters. Oh. Well, I don't see why you're being so nice to her. We are paying her to live in our house for nothing. <laughs> and think how much it costs us. I'm nice to her because maids are so scarce nowadays. And darling, darling, please make a desperate, all-out effort to like her. All out? Mm -hmm. That sounds like an order. It's meant to sound like an order. What do you think she'll look like? Oh, she probably look like a... A horse. Like a horse? Mm -hmm. Or as strong as one, I hope. <laughs> hey, here's my train. Oh. And uh, your new maid is coming in on the other track in about ten minutes. I'm as nervous as though I were taking a job. Well, you better go around under the tracks and meet her, darling. I'll take the car. She'll have baggage. Yeah, you know? uh, good, good hunting, darling. Yeah, what train are you coming out on it's tonight? The 614. I'll be there. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, darling, and, and good luck. Thanks. <laughs> glad you got here. Oh, what did you say your name was? Emma Catstein. Well, Emma, I'm sure we're going to be very happy together. Oh, you only brought one suitcase? No, Mom. Well, where are the rest of them? I got two others. They're in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn? I leave them there till I see if I like the people. Oh, well, I'm sure you'll like us, Emma. Especially Mr. Norton. He's well, you'll like him. Yes, Mum. It's, uh, it's such a nice drive to our house. Is this the first time you've been to Connecticut? I think so. Lots of trees, isn't there? Oh, yes. They're all just coming out. Some people like them. Did you ever live on a farm before? Not on a farm. Oh, I see. Well... Where did you live? I mean, uh, you didn't live on a farm. For a Mrs. Morris. Oh, really? Where for a Mrs. Morris? Brooklyn. Oh. Well, this is different from Brooklyn. How many in the family? Just the two of us, Emma. Well, Emma, here it is. This is our house. Yes, ma'am. This the front door? Yes, it is. And we'll give you a key, of course. Where's the back door? On the other side of the house. Why? I don't know. Well, Emma, let's go right in. Everything's pretty clean, I think, and you really can just spend the day getting settled. Yes, Mum. This is the living room, and that's the dining room, that way. We just finished putting in that bay window there. Oh! Emma, what's the matter? What's that? Well, that's our dog. That's Bluff. Come here, Bluff, old fellow. Put out your paw for Emma. Say, how do you do? He belong here? Of course he does. Oh, you mustn't be afraid of him, Emma. He's only a great Dane. They're the gentlest dogs in the whole world. Uh -huh. Bluff, I guess you'd better run outside and play for the rest of the day. You mustn't be upset, Emma. He, he just likes to make believe he's fierce. He wouldn't hurt a fly, really. Now we'll see the kitchen. What kind of stove is it? Electric. And it's new. I like electric stoves. Good for frosting. Oh, you must be a very good cook from what you say. Yes, Mum. Oh. Well, that's fine. Is this the kitchen? Oh, yes, yes. And uh, there's the new ice box. Yeah. Ooh! <gasps> Emma, there's nothing to be afraid of. That's only our cat. Doesn't look like no cat. Must be a country cat. Oh, no. We brought him from New York. 
His name is Shakespeare. He won't bother you a bit when you say it. Cass isn't usually so bad. In Brooklyn, I didn't mind him none. Well, now, Emma, let's look at your room. We just fixed it up. It's right here down on the L. No. No what? No, I ain't gonna look at my room. But don't you even want to see it before you start to work? I don't like dogs. Oh, you'll love Bluff when you get to know him. I don't like cats. Shakespeare? I don't like the place. I don't think I'll be staying. But, but, but you, you said you, you liked the stove. I changed my mind. You take me to the station. Why, Emma, maybe you'll change your mind about that, too. I don't change my mind after I've changed it. But if you met Mr. Norton, you might. Please take me back. And please, you take him out of the way. That cat. Oh, poor Shakespeare. When David finds out what you've done, he'll never forgive you, you... You cat. <laughs> oh, there isn't time to have the agency send someone else before he comes back. Oh, is there only one more time? David! Hi, hello. Here I am. That's good. That's good. Here I am, too. Hello. Mm. You look nice. Mm, you look wonderful. Well, tell me, how is she? Oh, simply marvelous. Oh, boy, that, that's a break. All the way back, she told me about the things she can bake. She's an expert on frosting. Oh, frosting? Frosting. Mm, sounds like a real cook. Oh, I'll bet she is. And tell me, is, is she a good houseworker? Oh, I suppose. Oh, that is great, great. Come on, come on, let's go home. You know, we are awfully lucky. Are we? We sure are. Why? Because we found a maid who... Now, see here. See here, we... We decided we wanted a maid, and you've got a good one. Yes. Now, tell me, don't, don't you like her better than you expected to? David, I hate her. You hate her? Yes. Now, see here, darling, if this nonsense has gone far enough, here, let's turn off the motor and thrash this thing out right now. I never want to see her again. Hey, you sound serious. What sort of a, a dragon is she? I, I can't wait to get home and see for myself. You won't. I won't what? You won't see her. She's gone. She left. She left? Just, just like that? Just like that. Why on earth didn't you say so right away? I thought you'd be angry. Angry? I am angry. I'm... Claudia. Yes, darling? Now tell me, just what did you say to her? I just didn't say anything to her. Bluff said something to Bluff? her. Bluff? Shakespeare said something to her. Shakespeare? I said nothing at all. Then she made me take her away. Oh. Oh, you mean she uh, doesn't like dogs and cats? Not only she doesn't like dogs and cats, but she doesn't like our house. She sounds terrible. She is terrible, perfectly terrible. But listen, just a minute ago you said she sounded wonderful. Well, I I wouldn't stand for anyone in the house who, who doesn't like animals. And she didn't like our house she either. She did not? Well, I, I wouldn't want anyone... Like that around the place, would you? Well, you said it didn't matter what she was like. I'm surprised you waited for her to leave. I, I would have asked her to leave before she got a chance to say anything. But we've got to have a maid, darling. Well, we don't have to take just anybody, Claudia. It's still our house. Oh, David, I love you. <laughs> of course, darling. She was terrible, but it's partly your fault. My fault? When you've hired someone who's going to do the work around the house, like a new maid, the... The first day, you've got to treat her with kid gloves. David, I did. No, kid no, gloves. No. You mustn't ask her to make dinner the first day. But, David... In fact, when you have a new maid, you've got to invite her out to dinner the first night. The very best restaurant you can find. David, are you crazy? No, of course. I'm crazy about the nicest maid I ever took to dinner. Mm -hmm. dum, 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 dum. La, 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 la. The hostess who goes to all sorts of trouble often wonders why her guests don't seem at ease. Usually, it's because she's not at ease. The clever hostess keeps a case of Coca-Cola in the house and always manages to have a good supply on ice. Then she can turn any occasion into a party simply by bringing out a tray full of those frosty bottles and suggesting, have a Coke. How's your supply of Coca-Cola, by the way? Mr. King, oh, if you don't mind. Emma Casty. Hello. Hello. We're all awfully sorry that you decided not to stay with the Nortons. That's too bad. Nothing against the Nortons. 
I just didn't want the job bad enough. That's as good a reason as any, I suppose. Living in the country with all those trees. Nope. Not for me. Maybe Claudia's going to feel like that, too, tomorrow. She likes trees. Queer. Trees aren't all she has on the farm, though. She has plumbing, and plumbing sometimes means pipes that burst. Glad I didn't stay. Goodbye, Mr. King. Goodbye, Emma Casdy. As I was about to say, every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For Coca-Cola makes any pause, the pause that refreshes. And ice-cold Coca-Cola is everywhere. This broadcast of Claudia was supervised and directed by William Brown Maloney. A whole different time. When that Coca-Cola that you drank at the corner drugstore in a glass bottle was bottled about 10 blocks away or 2 miles away or not much farther. Claudia, May 5th, 1948 here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Thank you for making us a part of your day. Thank this station. Support their advertisers. It's their kindness and courtesy that allow us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite station. Miss a day? You don't have to miss a single show. All of our shows are available by on on-demand st- streaming by going to classicradio.stream. Classicradio.stream. 24 hours of classic radio theater each week. You can also find our social media links. You can also find a list of places where our shows are available by podcast, by downloading uh, Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Uh, and you can also buy me a coffee. The buy me a coffee money helps us acquire additional collections and maintain our distribution channels. Classicradio.stream. Thanks for tuning in. Tell your friends the greatest radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station.